move on to our, our first presentation. Thank you. And that is from Ike Okafor. He's a, a consultant in pediatric emergency medicine and chair of the medical board in Children's Health Ireland at Temple Street. Um, so I'd like to welcome Ike and thank you for agreeing to participate today and looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks for having me. Um, I have been to, I've been asked to talk about my personal experience with COVID-19 as a healthcare worker. Um, I have no slides prepared, so I'm just going to talk about how I fared uh, during that difficult time and how I've been since then. And I'm happy to take any questions. I think we all remember how it was last year. Uh, the first case we had in Ireland uh, came on the 29th of February. It came to my hospital and Mona, I'm sure, still remembers that because it was a difficult night for all of us. It was a Saturday night. It was a weekend and the child had come back from Italy and was swabbed in our ED, tested positive and all hell broke loose. That was index case, case number one for Ireland. The media were all over it. Nobody slept for that weekend. And the following week, we had every single child who was a neighbor of that child, who was in that child's class coming down to our ED because they all started to have fever and they all wanted to be swabbed. So we were overwhelmed and we started to swab them. And we decided then to open up a swabbing center in Connolly. I'm saying this because I think that's where I might've come in contact with COVID because it was very early. It was within the first two weeks of the, of the virus being identified in the country. And I hadn't traveled to Northern Italy and I hadn't gone skiing, which was, which seemed to be where everybody at that point uh, was getting it from. At that stage, there was very little community spread and, um, and uh, it, was, it was very puzzling for me. But two weeks later, I started, I think it was, a th it was the first day, I started to feel a bit feverish. Um, I started to have a bit of a runny nose. I was coughing a bit and I thought it was my sinusitis because I, si I, I do get sinus um, infections around that time of year. Unfortunately for me and for my colleagues, I had attended about a million meetings, um, <laughs> both as a member of the hospital executive and also as a student in RCSI. So, and of course I was working as well that week. I was symptomatic for two days and it didn't even click. It didn't even occur to me that I could have COVID. It was the last thing on my mind. I thought anything else but COVID because at that stage it was, the question we were asking everybody was, had you been to China? Had you been to Italy? If you hadn't been to Italy, it was unlikely to be COVID because at that stage, the community spread was very little. The numbers were less than 30 or 40 at that stage. And most people we could, we could identify where they got it from. Eventually, I, I picked up the phone and I spoke to my uh, microbiology consultant and he said, listen, I just do a swab. And I did a swab. I did a swab on the Thursday night and then I went home. The next day, he said, don't come to work until he calls me. And he called me and said, Ike, unfortunately, your COVID swab is positive. And I said, how? You know, how is that possible? He said it is uh, that, uh, that, the, that the PCR is very strongly suggestive, um, you know, of COVID. Um, so... I, and he said that, uh, so, so I asked him, what do I do next? He said, no, you stay at home, you self isolate um, and, you, and you wait and you get a call from, uh, from occupational health. So I said, listen, I, I have been in contact with about a million people in the last two days. So I started getting calls. I gave everybody's name and they started doing the contact tracing. Over the weekend, I felt more unwell and uh, I was asked to go into the Marta hospital to see the ID consultant. He saw me, felt I was breathless, and then I was admitted into the, into the National Isolation Unit in the Marta Hospital for five days. Um, difficult five days, um, and then I was discharged home. My uh, family were all swabbed, and, and, and unfortunately, every single member was positive as well for, uh, you know, for, for the virus. Um, so they were also self-isolating at home. Um, the acute period was probably the most difficult period for me, especially when I went into hospital. I think when I was at home, I felt it was okay. I'll be fine. I was having the fever. I was having all the symptoms. I felt breathless, but I felt that once I was at home, I was going to be okay. But as soon as I was asked to go into hospital and they kept me, that was where I started to get worried. You must remember at that time, this was March 2020. Everything on TV was about the queues of coffins waiting to, to, be, to be buried in Northern Italy. And that was all we were getting was the numbers were going up um, in Europe and it was all doom and gloom. So I was scared, I was scared about me. And then subsequently when my wife tested positive, my wife's aunt and my kids, I was worried about them. 
Um, also, I felt isolated because they were at home and I was in hospital and they weren't letting me go home. I felt isolated and helpless. I mean, how could I help them? Um, how could I help myself? It was a bit of, uh, it was, a, you know, it was, you know, there was, um, there was a lot of information. Um, people were sending me information. I was, you know, as a doctor, you're curious. So you're reading about stuff. You're reading about, you know, published um, journals. You're reading about information from ID sites. And there was so much information. There was lots of news. I think one thing that helped me was I stopped listening to the news and that kind of helped me calm down a bit. Um, but I got a lot of support. I got a lot of support from my colleagues. I got a lot of support from, from Mona, who is there now on the, on the panel, from all my other colleagues and the executive, my clinical colleagues, my parents, my family. Uh, the, the texts and the calls were really helpful. Just kept, you know, helped me to keep distracted. And then I was discharged home. And when I was discharged home was where the real problem really started for me because I still had to self-isolate for two weeks um, and I wasn't allowed to come back to work until my swab was negative. And that took a while because my swabs kept on being positive for three weeks after my infection. And um, yeah, I struggled a lot. Um, the first thing for me was the lethargy. The lethargy you feel, the complete lack of energy is hard to describe. Um, you just want to just stay in bed for the whole week. You don't want to get up. Um, even when the fever stops and the breathlessness stops, the lethargy and the lack of energy just continues. You have no motivation. You don't want to do anything. You don't want to, you know, because I was thinking, okay, I could work from home. I have my laptop. I have my access from home, but I just struggled to join any meetings, to do anything um, offsite. It was really, 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 really hard. Then you continue to get the aches and pains and then you're wondering whether the aches and pains are due to the fact that you're lying down all day long or whether they're actually real. Um, and then your sleep pattern goes because you're sleeping so much during the daytime, you stop sleeping at night and then you get into this horrible pattern of poor sleep and just struggling to sleep. So yeah, so the, 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 um, those were the key things for me initially. And then of course you were um, emotionally more labor. So you get very upset over little things you know, and um, and um, sometimes you're excessively happy for no reason. And um, I felt that was a strong factor as well. Um, Work-wise, I think the, the, the most the most significant thing I felt about work was that I was sorry that I exposed so many people to the virus. Luckily, nobody at work was positive. And um, I was sorry that I couldn't help them. Despite the fact that I took out a lot of the clinical staff and they were short staffed, I still couldn't help them. And that was a bad feeling. I felt I was left out of things. I wanted to know what was happening. I felt a lot of inadequacy that I couldn't really, you know, help and, you know, get stuff done because it was at the early stages of the pandemic and I really wanted to be involved in stuff. Um, even when I went back to work, I just felt that I wasn't at my pre-illness pre levels. I just felt I couldn't get back into it. I felt slowed down. I was having memory issues. Um, I just felt like you know that I was carrying a lot of weight and I couldn't move as fast as I could move because I you know I, I was able to do a, a thousand things at once pre pre COVID and then I realized that I could only do one thing at once then and th that was difficult for me um, and I didn't know how I could help myself so I felt a bit helpless um, for my family I felt predominantly sorry for exposing them to it and uh, they didn't let me forget it my kids especially dad you brought this to the house and they kept saying it eventually you start to feel sorry for them. Now, the, 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 you know, the, the kids were fine. There was nothing wrong with them. I had a cousin who I exposed to who got really sick and, uh, and um, ended up in ICU. And I felt really sorry for that. Um, you know, people became irritable around the house because we couldn't go out. We were self-isolating for two weeks. We couldn't shop. The neighbors helped us. So there was a lot of kind of arguing and, you know, very, very little things led, led to conflict. And I think the lockdown then worsened things as well. Um, I felt that there were things that needed to be done that weren't done and we couldn't do them because nobody had the energy to do them. And, you know, when you're all sick in the house, you know, those things just seem to be less important and, you know, and, you know, less relevant at, at the time, even though they were important. And, uh, yeah, and, um, you know, it continued for a while. So what helped me, what, what really helped me was coming back to work. I felt work was crucial. Eventually, despite my swabs being positive, I was able to convince my occupational health and microbiology 
um, that the positivity was just a residual viral load, which eventually people found out that that, ha that happened to some people. And after I was at home for three weeks, I was eventually able to allow, I was eventually allowed to come back in and work helped and slowly getting back to work. One thing that touched me a lot was when I first came back to work after getting the clearance to come back to work, I walk, I came into the main area of the ED and all the doctors and nurses came out and they gave me a standing ovation for up to five minutes and that really touched me and I really felt moved by that. Um, and um, yeah, and then I started walking. I and myself and my wife, we, walk, we wake up every morning and we go for a walk for about an hour and we continue that for three, four months and that helped um, eating well. And then other people having it then, I was able to talk to other colleagues then who, did, you know, who you know, who got the virus later on down the line and talking about it with them also helped me. And I found that they were struggling with the same issues, with the same energy issues, with the same lack of motivation, with the same emotional problems. And, you know, that kind of helped me to, to then understand, you know, that, listen, that there are other people who this is happening to. Um, currently, I, I don't feel I'm still 100%. Um, I still feel that, that I, you know, pre-COVID, um, compared to my pre-COVID state, I'm probably around, you know, the late 70s, uh, early 80s in terms of, you know, what I was, you know, what I'm currently able to achieve. It could just be natural aging because it's been a year since then, but uh, yeah. But, um, and then you find out then that other problems then come up and you have to deal with them. So the whole post-COVID thing is still far behind you. It's been an experience. Um, I, tell, I, tell, I, tell, I tell people now, having COVID in March, 2020 is one of the most scary things that could ever happen to you, even if you're in hospital, and, and especially if you're in hospital. It was really scary. It was doom and gloom and people didn't know what they were dealing with then. And uh, no, it was, a, it, was a, it was a terrifying experience. And I'm happy for all the support I got from all my colleagues, from my family and from everybody. Uh, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Ike, for sharing that incredible story. What would you say to somebody who's just been diagnosed with a positive COVID test now um, on reflection and, and, and what you've been through? And it's a year later, which, and you're still at 70%. I mean, really, it's, it's frightening. And I can't even imagine what you went through looking at the TV and, as you say, queues of coffins and um, while your family were at home and everybody was so worried. What would you what would you have to say now to somebody who's just been diagnosed with COVID? Well, I mean, I would tell them that uh, um, it is it is it is difficult. Um, it's it's uh, I mean, right now we we understand the condition better. The treatment is better. There are more options now. Um, I know people are doing well. Less people are dying from it. There's less morbidity from it. But just to be just to be prepared that it could it could be longer than they think. Um, and even when you get better from the acute phase, you might if you try and rush yourself. Sometimes you might find that you still you still struggle a bit. Just to give it time. Um, but just to be generally optimistic that uh, it is something that you know that you know that that will that will eventually go, um, and uh, and that uh, the technology, you know, in terms of you know the the you know the treatment for it now is much much better than it was. It's you know it's no longer the scary illness that we thought it was, even though we um, unfortunately people are still dying from it. But we are treating it so much better now. Um, no, I, I would, I, I would tell them to be largely optimistic that it will get better, and just to be prepared for the kind of long COVID and the lethargy and the lack of motivation that might come out of it. Well, it's a testament to your resilience and um, strength that you're here, and thank you for sharing your story with us. I think it's important for all of us to to get an insight like like that, and it's very, very, very generous of you to to, to do that today. We're very grateful. Has anybody any questions from the panel or comments? Uh, sorry, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, you know, I'm, I know I for a long time and thank you for accepting our request to come and join us today and sharing that very powerful story. I know it has been very, very difficult for you and your family and then coming to a platform like this and sharing your story need more encouragement and more courage. And you did that. And thank you so much, Ike. And it's a wonderful to have you and Koli as a friend and a colleague. 